Hello everyone, my name is Lewis Hotter. I'm an advanced care paramedic working out of Brisbane, Queensland. Today we're going to be covering drug facilitated intubation preparation. Of note, uh, we're going to be talking about four key decision times or decision points during the procedure. We're going to be talking about airway assessment, patient optimization, particularly regarding perfusion and oxygenation and ventilation, as well as our setup with our airway adjuncts uh, lining with our vortex approach. Drug facilitated intubation is the process of sedating or anaesthetizing relaxing or paralyzing and intubating a patient to improve and control their physiological permanence and to optimize their care. Why use a DFI? What are the indications? Airway compromise, potential or actual, respiratory failure or impending respiratory failure. Considering the patient's requirements is important there. Neuroprotection and specific patient requirements, such as in a TCA overdose. There are a lot of good reasons why a DFI would be dangerous and not advisable, but the most definitive contraindication is a lack of ETCO2 therefore rendering an inability to secure a tube or confirm. There are many complications to the DFI procedure, most notably hypoxia, hypertension and cardiac arrest in the literature. But I'd point your attention to a physiological change that occurs when you paralyze a patient, where you reduce the pharyngeal tone, you may have a patent or partially obstructed airway and make it completely obstructed, causing a number of complications for your patient. This also emphasizes the need to reassess your patient as your patient's airway changes, which is relevant to our airway assessment, and the need for us to dynamically change our plan. The first DFI decision-making point comes after the assessment of the patient, probably prior to your first airway assessment. This is a risk-benefit analysis to determine whether the patient is of greater benefit than risk from this procedure. If you determine that a DSI is of more benefit than risk, you must perform an airway assessment. What is the utility of an airway assessment? Is it the prediction of a difficult airway? Well, no. This is a table included by the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists, and it shows that the positive predictive value of any test or any set of tests is very low in predicting a difficult airway. So where is the utility of an airway assessment? Well, it's in evaluating the risk. The more problems that you find, the more likely you are going to have a problem with your airway. It's also gonna be predictive of where a problem can come from and how you may troubleshoot it. For example, if you have a C-spine or posterior column concern, you may reach for a video laryngoscope more early. If you have a beard, you may go towards a supraglottic airway more quickly than a bag valve mask. Or if you find on an airway assessment that securing an airway is not feasible at all, you may go to a surgical approach. It aids in the decision making and the risk benefit analysis of your patient. It is important to summarize that no matter what you find, you must treat every airway as a dangerous and difficult airway until proven otherwise. For this procedure, I'd recommend wearing gloves, glasses, N95 or P2 mask, a gown, and probably a face mask as well, because we are using some aerosol in procedures. For the airway assessment of the patient, I'd recommend two different phases, the verbalized history phase and the inspection of our patient phase. For the verbalized history phase, I use the mnemonic ABC QRS. So age, greater than 55, body habitus, height, weight, and build, cancer, the C, so any history, any recent radiation treatment or anything like this. And then Q, three focus questions, pregnancy, any recent surgery, and any intubation or anesthetic difficulties. Then for R, we have reflux, and S, we have sleep up. For the inspection of patient phase, I think it's first really good to start with the C-spine because this will determine what we can and can't do. So obviously, do we have any C-spine injury? And do we, if not, have good flexion of the neck and extension of the head? If so, that is going to give us a really good indicator of whether we're going to have posterior column problems or not. We need to look for a presence of the beard and address that. Whether we want to do clad wrap, whether we want to lubricate, we need to implement a plan when we identify it. Facial trauma. Do we have a loss of integrity of the jaw? Are we going to have a good seal? Are we going to have foreign bodies, including teeth and blood loss of being our hair one? Then we need to look at the size of the mandible. Is it receding? Is it really big? And how mobile is it? Can we do a good big jaw for us? The movement. From there, we're going to look for dentures. So, are they present? Are they not present? Um, and are they partial? Should we be removing them for when we're going for an ETT versus when we're doing a back mount mask? Is there a profound overbite? And are there buck teeth that are going to limit our view of the airway? We can do as well a modified 332. Obviously, we probably don't have too many opportunities where we can determine the incisor of gap here, but we can measure the thorough mental distance. And we can also put two fingers from the prior and can't the myo bone to give us some indicators about the airway anatomy. And do we have any recent neck surgery? Do we have any scars on the patient?
My assessment limitations in the pre-hospital setting include the fact that paramedics are novice practitioners in managing airways. We have an increased cognitive load and with severe time constraints. Our patients are either unconscious or non-compliant often, therefore we can't get history. They're physiologically deranged and non-fasted, making assessment difficult. And they often have specialised requirements such as milk. It is at the conclusion of your airway assessment that we determine whether DFI is of more risk than benefit. We can still pull out at this stage. We must also formalise our plan using our ABDC approach and our Vortex approach. What is going to be the most appropriate for this patient? Do we have an elderly man with no dentures, with a big beard, and are we going to steer away from the bag valve mask, moving more quickly to an LMA, for example? I will now demonstrate my equipment setup in relationship with the Vortex approach. Option A is ETT. So this is the equipment I have. At the top we have a stylet, followed by a bougie. You know, we have a manometer to measure the pressure. We have tape to secure it. We have lubricant. We have a 10mm syringe. We have two laryngoscopes with handle attached. It should be a size three and four. I've used a two in this image, however. And we have different sizes of ETT to choose upon when assessing the patient. For the bag valve mask setup, we should already have this really done to the pre-oxygenation phase. But we have the mask filter, PTCO2, peak valve attached ensure that we're delivering high flow oxygen. We also have two MPAs in here. And we have our suction ready and functional. To ensure that we can deliver good bag valve mask ventilation. We will move our bag valve mask and load the patient underneath the stretcher for ease of access. For option C, we've opted for an LMA. Here we have two sizes of which we choose one and lubricate the posterior surface. We have lube, tape, tie, OPA in case of failure, and a syringe to blow up the cuff. The setup has a size 6 ETT, bougie, scalpel, and gauze. You'll note the positioning of equipment in relationship to our patient. So we start with our first option. Up here we have our ETTs. So we have a pre-styleted ETT, a bougie, if we want to use that as a second option, and two differently sized ETTs appropriate for the patient. We have the manometer and syringe ready to go as well. Pre-lubricated. For our second option, if those two fail, we can come to either our supraglottic airway, which is prepared right next to us, like so, or we can come back to our bag valve mask down here. It's important to note the position of the nasopharyngeal airway, which we may place in instead of the nasal cannula. At any stage, we may be required to use the suction, which has already been tested and ready and working. And over here, we have our final option, a surgical airway, if all fails. Although mostly done in unison, I'd suggest the next step is DFI optimization. For airway optimization, we'll demonstrate ramp. So this is the ramping position. We pad underneath usually the shoulders to push the shoulders and thorax up and forward. And really we usually do this in conjunction with the sniffing position and the padding underneath the head. And the point of this is to align the ear canal with the sternal notch, which is pretty good here. This is really important in our obese and our pregnant patients with that large abdominal contents pushing up against the diaphragm and splinting the lung. This position increases functional residual capacity and improves oxygenation. The tongue is less likely to fall posteriorly. It decreases the aspiration risk and it is associated with increased or better laryngoscopy views. It is associated with decreased intubation and airway related complications as well. After airway, we need to talk about ventilation and oxygenation optimization. The goal of this is a longer safe apnea time. And we achieve this by denitronizing the functional reserve capacity, increasing SAO2 and PaO2. The only one of which we can measure is SaO2. Therefore, I'd recommend three minutes at minimum of oxygenation with a bag valve mask, with a two-person technique, and with nasal cannula. Now I'd just like to demonstrate the pre-oxygenation phase. So we have an OPA in situ. We can't put MPAs in because we've got nasal cannula attached to the face, which is taped down to prevent dislodgement. We've obviously got bag valve mask attached with 15 litres of O2, 15 litres of O2 in the nasal cannula. Now, ideally we'd do this with a two-person technique, but I'm just going to demonstrate it's a one-person technique for the sake of this video. We have the peak valve attached to ensure that we're not entraining room air. The last thing that we want to do is pull this mask away, entrain all this room air, and ruin all the hard work we've put in. So we must continue our pre-oxygenation until the patient is definitively apneic. We can turn up the peak if we believe that the patient has a physiological shunt and is going to benefit from it, and we're having a tough time ventilating the patient and getting the sats where we need to. To talk about delayed sequence intubation, we use procedural sedation to optimise ventilation and oxygenation, or a procedure such as D. In regards to perfusion, we need to really be thinking about fixing the cause, if it's a hemorrhage, for example, or decompressing a chest for a tetanium of thorax, administering 
a small fluid bolus or a large fluid bolus, depending on the physiological parameters of the patient. <clears throat> we need to choose our induction agent wisely, propofol versus ketamine, for example. And I would advocate for a noradrenaline infusion for our vasopressor. And why do we do this? To prevent hypertension, cardiac arrests, and adverse outcomes. I would advocate for a noradrenaline infusion to maintain perfusion. I'd do this using a spring fuser uh, infusion pump. And fusion is greater than a bolus in maintaining therapeutic levels of a drug. Of the vasopressors, noradrenaline has the safest physiological profile. And extravation risk is likely exaggerated with very low rates of adverse outcomes. After optimizing the patient, we have a new decision point. And we need to ascertain whether the patient is still of more benefit than risk. We're DFI and we need to ensure that we've done everything we can to optimize them and make them safe for the procedure. The final and fourth decision point I'll talk about in this video occurs during the procedure itself. We're gaining information when we go into the oropharynx with the laryngoscope, particularly about the middle column, and that can inform our plan and which techniques are gonna be likely or unlikely to be successful. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my video. 